What's up everybody, this is Soup Bowl, and we're going to take a look at Stupid Soup behind the scenes. And this level took just over a month. We started in December, I think like December, like Christmas or something, maybe right after Christmas. So we got this out super quick. I basically worked on this every single day uh, up until this point to get the final version out. And um, it turned out really, really well. In my opinion. So we're gonna take a look. So the first room here is pretty simple. We just have, um, you know, just one up spam at the beginning. And then we have a block that will take this cannon up and then block your path if you try to get this checkpoint. And um, something interesting about the very beginning, or some, something interesting about the really ur early versions is that you could actually cheese this checkpoint. Just like that. But we put up some extra blocks here to prevent that. So some people actually tried to do that, even after playtesting, uh, but were unable to. So you come over here then, try to grab the bomb, and then throw it over here to hit the switch, but uh, the bomb just dies and falls down with the cannon. And that's because of this. It's just a simple seesaw mechanic here. And then if you have anything else on this, it'll all come crashing down. So yeah, that's how this works. I'm not going to explain any of the twice twice stuff until it's time. And I'm basically going to be going through every single troll chronologically as it was presented in the level. So, I will be explaining pretty much everything. So over here, um, you'll notice a Roy here that wasn't here before. This is actually despawned because of this hard block. And um, I'll explain this later, again, because it's part of the twice twice. But uh, it's important later. That's all I'll say about it right now. This right here is pretty straightforward, nothing much to say. There's just a, a no block behind the blue. And then this will come springing up. Um, down here is just a mole contraption. Um, it's basically to spring the uh, beetle back up in your face while you're kind of bathing yourself in these shinies. So this is how it works. The mole kind of bounces on the first no block down here and then will bounce up on this one to gain extra height. So that's how that one works. And then over here we have a thwomp set up. So what you're supposed to do here, that not many people did, is you're supposed to kind of take it slow and be really cautious about this part. And then you'll notice, oh crap, there's a new cannon. So they'll get out of the way really quickly. And then um, basically the hitbox of the people in here is, is weight is too far into the one way so you grab it but you get shoved away by the one way and you have to die so that's the idea there um, all it is is a thwomp activating a spike ball and then um, this contraption here with the note block and the wall right here um, allows this to hit the switch twice so it's a really efficient use of sprites to be able to hit a switch on and off really quickly and then down here it's just a pow block coming into the note block and then this will launch the cannon up into this space up here. So, pretty simple stuff so far. Nothing too mind-blowing. So for this room, um, again, pretty simple. So, this is all a timing-based troll. So, first of all, the, the, the initial idea with this room was that we would have a gravity troll. So, um, this is why there's a bunch of semi-solids here, because you can't actually tell which uh, mode it's in. You could be swimming right now, or you could be actually in the regular castle mode. So the idea was that they would come up here and get hit by one of these and then fall down here, not realizing it's not swimming anymore. But it didn't really get anybody because I, I it was just, this was really poorly set up. And we just kind of left it this way. We were like, eh, we didn't really care. So we just left it like this. So basically, after that, you land on this, and then actually what happens is this Thwomp will hit the switch because you're turning big. So once you have the P-Balloon, you're in a, uh, your hitbox is a lot smaller than you are as Big Mario. 
So your hitbox comes flying upwards, which is enough to activate the thwomp. I, I'm pretty sure that's how that works. So then, as you can see on the, on the right, there's a spike ball that comes down, really, and it actually takes a long time for the switch. It's just a timing thing. So that's how that works. And then this up here is just a mushroom that will come down after the switch is hit. So over here we have the hidden mushroom tool. And this one, um, I found this a while back actually. Um, so it's basically, you spawn in a uh, clown car from a note block and it actually hides the claw with a launcher behind it perfectly. So everything inside of the claw and the entire claw itself is completely hidden. And nobody has any idea what is behind it or what the troll is. So this worked out pretty well. And essentially you just let the claw go and then jump over it. So for this part, um, it is a progressive power-up troll as probably most of you guys at this point, but what happens is um, this beetle is what is the activator. So once you jump from this position, the beetle will start moving and it'll hit this note block and the note block has a progressive power up. So if you collect the mushroom the first time, this contraption won't do anything. And then the second time, it, there'll be a mushroom that spawns out of this. So you'll be small and the mushroom will spawn and the mushroom will hit this note block, which then pushes this spike ball into the switch, thus killing the launcher that's right here. So interestingly, the reason we, why we have it like this is because we can't actually put this down here because of the claw. The claw actually prevents you from doing that. So we had to make something kind of work, so we just used this. This actually works pretty well because then there's a switch here that will kill this first cannon. Um, so over here, oh, um, and there's also a vine that activates right here. Not many people figured that out, but the idea was to jump right here, and then the vine would come down, but not many people figured that out. So I think, I think it was okay overall. So this part right here is just some really pure and weird jank, and basically what happens is this beetle will come down here, and it's actually in a one and a half tile gap right here. This is only one and a half tiles, so it's kind of a two tile monster stuck in a one and a half tile gap, and for some reason this beetle will fall right about here, and that's because it's only on the first platform. So you can kind of notice how the beetle kind of moves downward right after uh, the point where this platform ends, and that's all that's happening. It's just pure weird jank, and you're supposed to hit this and kind of cower over in this corner in fear, kind of waiting for something to happen while it comes crashing down on your face, basically. So the solution is to stay kind of right under the switch here. And this is the mechanism that kills the beetle um, once the troll is done. So what we have is a star and a pow. The, uh, the star will spawn the pow. This will spawn and start rolling right because you scroll the screen and it will start rolling whichever direction you're coming in from. So it'll be rolling right, and it'll get stuck right about here because of this conveyor. And then the flower, much like this other troll over here, will come on this note block and push the spike ball into the pow. So that's how this works. It's basically another timing-based troll. So down here, um, it's pretty simple also. So once you hit the P switch, this spike ball will come flying into this note block and then spawn things out of these blocks. And they happen to be a spring and a bomb in this case. The spring will blow up the bomb. So if, if you run really quickly and try to get out of the way in time, sit right in this spot, the bomb will get you. But in the second part of this troll, or the first part, however you want to look at it, is that you can actually you can actually um, drop the P-switch. So, I know some people didn't actually do this, but you can try to drop it and then pick it up and come over here, but 
the spring that spawns from this note block actually springs it directly down the pit. So that's how that works. So for the first room after CP1, it's also pretty straightforward. So um, the first thing that you do is come up to this. Um, there's shells that spawn from these note blocks. And you'll think, oh, I can go and get grab this shell real quick. But another block spawns suddenly out of nowhere and then breaks with a shellman in it. So you can't actually get that one up there. And then you'll realize that you have to get out of the way really quickly. So, this one kind of caused a lot of spaghetti, and um, we probably could have made this better, but we didn't. And um, I think the reason was because a lot of people kind of have to get used to swimming physics first. And after a while, most people started losing the spaghetti factor and got better at swimming, I guess. So, that kind of helped. Um, so basically, the thing to break the block is just this contraption. It's a thwomp that'll uh, destroy this block, which is holding up the cannon, and then the cannon will fall on the bomb, and then that bomb will break the block. And this thwomp is p per positioned perfectly so that it will only activate when you hit the block. So that's kind of cool. Um, over here, this is um, mostly Stevo's part, by the way. So Stevo made most of these chores. Um, if I missed who made the trolls in each section, um, I, which I probably have already, um, don't worry about it too much. Uh, most of the trolls are, are really uh, mixed in together, so um, yeah, it's everything is really mixed together. Um, so okay, so this part, um, let's see. So here you're supposed to. Think, I mean, so you have a choice here, right? Everybody loves choices. You can either go to this wonderful little shiny path, or you can just say no to it all and skip it. But that's kind of boring, so let's try the shiny path. Uh-oh. Whoopsie. <laughs> so what happens is there's actually um, mushroom platforms under here, and since you can actually see these tiny little white pixels right here, let me get in closer. Right here, you can see these little tiny white pixels, and this coin actually hides them perfectly. So, you just have no idea what it is until it already happens. So, yeah, you get screwed by that. And that's actually Steve-O's idea, and it worked out pretty well. We were actually worried it wouldn't work very well for a while, but it did. It ended up working pretty well. So this right here is just to get rid of the shell. Um, basically to be able to advance. Alright, so this part kind of has a little backstory. Um, so basically, so this hyperspeed here, um, when you hold up into the door, this hyperspeed thing actually was supposed to go to a different troll, and it was actually going to go near the ending, um, and it was going to involve a P-switch, believe it or not. So the P-switch would be like stuck on top of the door. There would be like a P-lock right here. Um, that would be on, and the instant you hit the P-switch, it would be off. So what's interesting is that once you would hit the P-switch, even though this tile would disappear, you would still go in the door on basically nothing, and then that would be the troll. But since it was at the end, and uh, we couldn't really find another place for it, we kind of decided to consolidate these two trolls. And it worked out pretty well, but I kind of... Um, I'm not super happy with how this one went, the hyperspeed. So this one was mine, and the seesaw was Stevo's. This uh, this is basically all Stevo's setup right here. And yeah, I mean we we tried to combine it, and it did work out pretty well for the most part. So I will explain the seesaw part first. In fact, actually the best thing to do is probably just to show it. So as you can see, Toad, for some reason, gets stuck on the seesaw, and apparently grounds are very sticky in underwater uh, mode. So nothing happens until you hit the block that's directly above you, and once that happens, it hits the shell and activates every single contraption. You can kind of see how that star gets bounced by the spring that spawns, so that's the whole reason for the spring right there. And then the 1-up goes on this magical journey, 
and will time perfectly with the uh, with the next boo that's incoming. So that's uh, the whole. Again, this this whole setup right here is Stevo's. And the reason the boos actually move really slow is because they're actually getting stuck in the lava. Hang on. Ah, oh my god, stupid bonsai. Alright, well anyways, they're getting stuck in the lava, and that's the reason they're going slow. So, down here, um, so actually what happens is that, another thing that happens is that this will hit the on-off switch over here. So, this actually, this whole contrap, this whole stack, um, acts as a counterbalance for this, uh, what, for this seesaw. So, not only does it activate as a counterbalance, it also activates a switch up here. And this switch will now um, release this mole, which will set up for the next hyperspeed troll. So essentially the mole and the um, muncher will be down here, and then um, it'll be a horizontal activation, horizontal positioning activation for this contraption. So this is basically a Jojolol blaster setup. And what happens is that um, after you hit a switch that's solid and these launchers will go inside of this big one, the launchers will spring upwards. So in order to prevent them from working initially, we have to put this cannon down here. And this cannon surprisingly um, is able to prevent this from working properly at the beginning. So once the switch is off, and once the block is solid, it'll work properly, and they will go inside. So this cannon is here so that it does not work, but it will work after the switch is activated, if that makes sense. It's a little hard for me to explain this, but that's kind of the idea, anyways. Okay, so for this next room, it's pretty simple, but the troll density um, is pretty high in this room. Mostly right around this area. Um, so the first troll uh, is kind of like magic to most people. <laughs> they, I, I doubt that anybody predicts this setup. But basically all it is, is two on and off blocks behind the behind the first clown car and then this this convey there's obviously a conveyor under here so what happens is believe it or not clown cars actually weigh down seesaws so once you hit the switch um, the seesaw will go down just like one sub pixel and enough to make you land on the conveyor immediately after so the instant you hit this on off switch wherever you are you will go flying and that's simply because of the one sub-pixel difference. Because, uh, because when the on-off blocks are on, the clown car is not weighing down on the seesaw. But once they are turned off, then the clown car is on the seesaw. And it's weighing it down. And enough to make it one sub-pixel difference. So that's how that works. It's kind of crazy. And I actually found this on my own, this tech. So it worked out pretty well, honestly. So over here, um, we have, let's see, I don't know what this is. So over here, we have uh, a couple of really dumb trolls. Um, this section, by, by the way, is mostly mine. I made most of this stuff except for the Chain Chomp troll that comes out of the wall later. That's actually uh, Stevo's uh, troll. Um, but what we have is... Um, just a mushroom and a block inside of it that will kind of push you into the spike. So you have to eventually just kind of swim really fast in this part to avoid getting pushed down too far. And then if you get the mushroom too early, you get stuck by this. And this is actually just normal swimming jank. I mean, it's not really jank, but it's normal swimming physics. It's just the slope prevents you from going. I guess it's like one half a square uh, difference or something. I don't know, but anyways. Um, so the hyperspeed works a lot like the last one. It's another Jojolol setup. Um, so the mole actually stays on the slope down there 
and then once it starts walking right, it'll fall in the lava, which sends the bomb that's stacked on top of it with it, and then it'll blow up this hard block, which basically releases the uh, launchers upwards. So that's all there is to this. And then of course you got the conveyor. You have to have this conveyor for every setup, every uh, hyperspeed. Um, so the way this one works, well, this is this is just a thwomp that explodes a bomb, and then this hard block that's under the thwomp will uh, kill the thwomp. So that's pretty convenient. Um, so let's see. This part is a little trickier to explain. So basically, I'll explain how the switch is activated first. You do actually have to hit this fish, and then the fish will come all the way down and ignite from the lava. And then immediately when it ignites, it'll melt these coins. And then this bomb will be here. So it'll just fall in the lava and hit this switch. And that's how that works. It's just a simple thing. And it's actually pretty convenient since we were using lava to actually use both of these setups right here. So these are actually pretty convenient. Um, the reason it's like this is because when you come out of this pipe, you have to, um, we wanted it to be able to come out we wanted people to be able to come out on either state because essentially and then go down this chute because the reason is is because of these on-off blocks because we don't want people going too low so that they collect these power-ups you know on accident we don't want people obviously collecting these power-ups that are supposed to kill you so we have these on-off blocks here and we want to um, be able to activate this switch no matter which state they come out on so this, we have this here, which is essentially just a spike ball that goes into the block if you're in the wrong state. So it'll switch for, automatically. And then since the bomb can just, if, it, if the bomb were right here and you came out of the pipe, the coin would already be melted from the previous time. So it has to be over here to avoid um, hitting the switch when you come out of the pipe. All right, so for the chain chomp troll, so this one's interesting. So once you hit the switch, this bomb over here will explode this block and scroll the screen over exactly one block. And that's enough to spawn this entire setup, basically. So you'll notice it's exactly one block, two blocks, three blocks, four, five blocks to spawn all of this stuff. So this one is only four blocks away, which means the thwomp will be spawned on the first block, but that doesn't matter because the these things are the thing the 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 thwomp activator is what matters the most. So it'll spawn off screen, and um, it'll spawn once the screen scrolls, and then the thwomp will activate, which basically sends the, the chain chomp in this direction. So I'll kind of show how this works. I can't really explain it too much, but. Um, Basically, as you can see, the spring is actually lifting this stump up, and the spring has two purposes. It's lifting the stump up, and it's also springing the chain chomp in this direction. So, both doing both at the exact same time, um, the spring that's, or the, by lifting the stump, the thwomp is able to hit it earlier. So, it's able to avoid killing the chain chomp in this case. You can kind of see how it works. It's pretty crazy. So it goes through in three entire blocks of wall and just to basically jump scare the player. So that's how that works. This is actually, so it was Stevo's idea and he gave a horrendous setup to me and I actually made this like 10 times better. So, I mean, his setup was absolutely ridiculous and I basically made this really nice looking setup here instead. So it worked out pretty well. So after the chain chomps, uh, we have this section, and it's kind of a little on the short side, but, well, I mean, like, with the trolls, so it's kind of on the low side for trolls. Um, so this first one is pretty simple, although like, there's occasionally some who actually didn't understand what was going on. Um, basically, there's a P-switch that's hanging on these conveyor belts, and once you hit the switch, the conveyor, the P-switch will start zooming at you while this shell up here is actually moving away from you. 
and honestly, this troll isn't that great. Like, it's just really interesting for its tech, and that's basically it. So, we didn't really do very well with this troll, it, or I didn't. I mean, I made the troll, so... I didn't do super well with this, but it did work out just because it was mostly interesting, new, and kind of funny. So, yeah, that's the whole reason. Um, this next troll is pretty simple, so actually, bas basically, um, if you go up here with the pea balloon, you will not be able to enter the clown car. And um, this is just psychological, there's no block here at all, it's just for psychological, haha, you got stuck by a muncher, and now you have to die by the spike thing. But nobody really did that. So everybody mostly understood to take damage. And then the next thing that happens is these clown cars are really weird. They like spring outwards. So what's going on here is that, yes, I actually squeezed clown cars together. Um, but the catch is that they have to settle in their little space over here. So we have the one way, obviously, to keep them in place. And for some reason, there's this weird time frame where the clown cars have to stay in the space without breaking these blocks. Um, so if I were to put the bomb down here, for example, it just does not work. If I can just survive, thank you. Yeah, see, look, they just they just go spewing everywhere. So I can actually show you exactly why that is. So I'm gonna put the bomb back up here. Well, it doesn't matter. So watch the clown cars really closely, and that little boop right there is is because basically tells you that they're done settling and they're ready to bring up. So basically, you but anytime, uh, anytime before that little boop happens, you cannot break these blocks. So it's this really weird time frame where they have to settle, like I was saying. So that's how this works. And then after that, though, they're basically one clown car until um, if, for example, I were to remove this wall, they actually spew out in the left direction. It's kind of weird. So you have to have a wall on either side of these clown cars. Yeah, see, that they, they just kind of spew out. So as long as there's a wall on both sides of the clown cars, and the clown cars don't go above that point, then this will work. And the idea was to kind of get them into the spike twice, one from the pea balloon and another from the clown cars. But the pea balloon kind of turned out to be more psychological, so they were able to kind of solve the puzzle and then kind of get a false sense of security for this clown car part, thinking that they were smart and took damage. So that kind of worked out pretty well. So after the clown cars, this is the room you come to, and this is quite a complicated room, not gonna lie. There is a lot of off-screen shenanigans happening over here, as you can see. But it should be pretty easy to explain. I don't think it'll be too hard to understand. Um, so for now, though, I'm just gonna explain what happens the first time you come out of this door. And obviously, stuff happens differently when you come out of this pipe, but I'll leave that for later. So. The only thing that happens, you can either go down this nice little red coin pit and heat it yourself, or you can throw the POW and try to go into this door. Now if you throw the POW and just sit here, um, something will happen, which is that this muncher will be, um, will be uh, flinged up into these cannons, and that this will then block your path and you'll be forced down into the red coin pit. So the first important thing to know is that these cannons actually move up a tiny bit um, to allow this setup to work. And um, you can't actually enter this door when the cannons move up. Um, here, let me get rid of some stuff here. So I'm gonna get rid of this block just to kind of show how the setup works. 
So you can see how they move up just barely, and this is actually um, really, um, this is really precise um, how this works. So we have a dry bones and a uh, muncher stack, and this since since it's a stack, things actually sink down a little bit while they're on the stack. So this muncher will be slightly lower than it is on screen right now in the editor. So. The reason that it has to be like this is because um, this this is going to be a little hard to explain, but um, basically the muncher can only go as low as the top of this muncher. Um, but since note blocks kind of sink down a little when they're hit, the muncher would normally go the full distance when it's sinking down. But with this here, it actually prevents that from happening. So it only goes down to the top of this muncher. And that distance alone is enough to um, change the trajectory of the muncher just a little bit and enough to push these guys up just ever so slightly. So this is the reason why this is here. The, um, this right here, uh, this coin will drop on this no block. After you hit the, after you activate the POW, um, a timing system activates, which is this coin will fall on the no block, which pushes this one up through the blue platform like so, and then onto this no block, and this no block then pushes this thwomp over to this no block, and by doing that, the thwomp will activate the seesaw because thwomps over no blocks activate seesaws, or act, uh, activate the thwomp, which then in turn activates the seesaw. So this muncher actually has two purposes. Its first purpose is to boop these up ever so slightly, and the second purpose is then to block them if they wait too long. And the purpose of the whole waiting too long troll is kind of fillery, but the reason is that they would go quickly um, into this door holding up and then would get sent into this pipe. So that's what happens. Whoa, I don't want to do that, that's for sure. So after coming out of this pipe and getting CP1, they will realize that, oh shoot, I think I might have just got CP1 because I completely forgot about the checkpoint. So they might be thinking, I mean, if there were, if they really had no faith in us, then we would, then they would really believe that they were CP1. But since we are such nice and caring individuals, we actually decided to change it and send you right back. So that's, that's a thing. So the reason it changes is mostly because of this fireball up here. And by spawning at this checkpoint, you scroll, you spawn at a higher distance on the screen which then enables this fireball to, to drop. And the fireball comes down here and melts these coins. And this uh, spring will get sent right about here, at this position on this cloud, which then will prevent the launcher from falling all the way, and then just spring right back up. So this is, um, and then, th yeah, this, this is what kind of the twice twice troll is. Um, this right here is actually, I did not explain this before, but this right here is to prevent them from discovering this pipe prematurely. So if they were to come over here and say, try to time this bomb with the switch, then it switches back off immediately. Um, the other purpose of this is to, um, switch it back on because when they come out of this pipe, they're on the off state but it needs to switch back on to make it look more convincing. So this will also just immediately shoot this back on once you're finished going through the pipe. Now, an interesting thing to point out is that this spring will not spawn the first time you come out of this pipe. And that's because, like I said, you're on the off state, which will despawn this spring. Um, so what happens is they this will continue down like normal, and if anybody decided to go 
to actually go in this door again, they would be met with this Roy on the other side. And this is that Roy that I mentioned earlier in the explanation. So, again, since you're coming out on the off state, this stuff will spawn off screen. No problem, right? It's way within spawn range off screen. So the bomb will spawn, and then since this contraption is down here is to switch it back really quickly, the bomb will then explode, which breaks this block that spawns that spawn blocks the Roy. So that's basically just death beyond this door. So yeah, that's that's all there is to this. Um, and then you just have these stupid fireballs right here that'll pop out. And that's basically all there is to this room. It's a little bit complicated. I mean, there's so many setups in this level that are using two things for different purposes. I mean, that are using one thing for two different purposes. And for that reason, it gets a little confusing, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of complicated. So back in here, when you come in through the second time, there, the reason that it's different, um, I will start off with why it's different. And you'll notice that you come on in at the exact same state that you were in before. And it's actually not a switch state thing. It is simply a spawning thing. So the, this swamp right here is what activates the switch, which will kill these cannons. And then you'll drop into the lava. So why it's different is simply because of spawning. When you come out of this door, there's no scroll stop on either side of the screen. And there's only a half block, as you can sort of see from this angle. There's only a half block on both sides of the screens. So if you count from that half block, we have one, two, three, four. I think this was four, right? So essentially, these guys are the only things that spawn out of this door right away. And the Thwomp spawns a half second or so later, but after these guys have already walked out of position. But by spawning in this room the second time, they will stay there. Like so. As you can see, they just stay there and don't walk off screen. But let me get rid of this screen scroll to show you exactly what I mean. When you spawn here, with a mushroom of course, Uh, um, they shouldn't be spawned yet. Hmm. Um, let me see here. Let me try that again. There we go. Okay, I don't know what it was about that, but it's completely consistent. And I don't know, something about that spawning at that door at that point was somehow messed up. But anyways, so now that those guys are down there... This swamp won't swamp. It won't activate. And it won't activate the switch. And that's the whole reason why it's different. And in fact, if you listen really closely, you can hear the swamp spawning. That little no block sound, that really faint no block sound that you just heard, was the no, was the swamp spawning. And see, the setup is all messed up because you come off screen from a little ways. So that's why it's like this, and that's why there's all this empty space over here. So, yeah, this is essentially all there is to this room for now. And then, of course, when you come in for the twice-twice, you put the POW down here, and then this POW will um, push the spike ball into the on-off switch. And the reason this doesn't work when you first come out of the door is because the spike ball will roll whichever direction you come out of. So, since this door is to the left of the spike ball, the spike ball will roll left and immediately get destroyed because it's hitting this wall. But but if when you come out of this pipe, it won't get destroyed and it'll be rolling right instead. So that's why this only works when you come out of this pipe. Furthermore, um, to destroy the munchers after you drop the POW, this is the contraption over here. It's just a, this will be in the off state, so it'll be going uh, to the right initially. So once the switch state is hit, this will go into this block, and then this guy will spawn the POW off screen. So that's basically all there is to this room. I know it's kind of complicated and a little overwhelming. 
Oh, uh, one more thing to mention is that these springs right here are strategically placed, and it actually it was a very late version that these were added, and that's because um, people were actually walking up to the door and holding up right on the door, but but um, but they have to go in the pipe. You can't actually go in this door. So they were getting really confused because they didn't know where to go, and they were getting just crushed by the, you know, the cannons. So by putting these springs here, they're actually unable to go all the way up against the wall, and are eight, and then we'll get sprung back quite a few times, um, and then into the pipe that way. So this basically eliminated all confusion related to this section. So this is why we added these springs here. And finally, one last note is that this mushroom here is here just in case you get hit by the munchers prematurely because you have to remain big in order for this setup to work. So this mushroom right here ensures that they'll keep a mushroom up until this point so that they go into the pipe. One thing I forgot to mention was that um, was how we clear checked this. And you might have noticed that the first time you come out into CP2 here, that you basically have to die. You can't go in this, I mean, you can't go in this pipe or basically anything. Um, so what we did was um, we have a spare power down here. So basically in this room, um, the power will only spawn once from this block. And you have to use it the first time to destroy the munchers and get through this pipe. So what we do is, um, since we cannot have, since we are basically, we are totally maxed out on entities in the subworld. So we have a spare pow in the main world instead. So all that happens is that it will spawn on the blue state and um, bounce up to this cloud. And then all I have to do is swim down here and then grab it and swim back up and as for getting into the pipe it's essentially what I did earlier was um, basically all I have to do is time it and obviously um, after clear checking it so many times I was able to get better at the timing of the bomb but it was pretty painful to get through the first few times so it got a lot easier obviously as I got better at it but um, that's basically how we clear checked it and then obviously you take the power that you grabbed from earlier and head in the pipe and then you're able to uh, send the power down the chute right here and then because everything works properly once you spawn from this pipe so that's how we clear checked it Okay, so finally into this room. This room is quite the monster as well. Just as much so as the last one. As you can see, there's just crap everywhere. Just littered everywhere. So I will do my best to explain. This is mostly Stevo's section. So if I miss anything, just blame Stevo. That's <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay, so the first thing that have um, so you have a choice, obviously. The first time you come out of this door, you can either decide to get the happy little Yoshi over there, or you can go this way. And this is the correct way, as indicated by this obvious arrow. So always trust the arrows, everybody. Always trust the arrows. So, um, if you try to get the 30, or if you just sit here on these blocks, this cannon will um, move upwards and you'll be able to, and you won't be able to continue. So how that works is this muncher is not spawned until a certain point. Basically, right about when you try to grab this 30, does it actually spawn? And so since it's resting on a seesaw, it does not despawn as long as the seesaw does not despawn. So you can come over as long as of a distance, um, but this, the muncher, if it were not resting on a seesaw, would normally despawn. But since it's on the seesaw, it does not despawn. So again, you can come over way over here and the muncher will still be spawned since it's resting. So um, that's all that happens in this first 
uh, state. This is all twice twice stuff that I won't get into just yet. I'm going to explain the first uh, the first state of the room. Um, this is also twice twice stuff. Basically the Yoshi will just sit up here at this point. But um, since it, the reason it's down here is so that the Yoshi will hatch in it anyway. So it has to hatch in order to despawn this Yoshi if you come over here too far. And this is actually um, this is Stevo's um, idea of of uh, despawning Yoshi's. So the idea was that you try to get this Yoshi, we're unable to, and then would have to be forced to go this way. So the piece which would activate, you get on the thwomp, and then oh look, you need the Yoshi. So they try to go back, but since this Yoshi. Um, spawns, This y the furthest Yoshi that was last on screen will despawn. So by the time you come back all the way back through this way, the Yoshi actually despawns and is not there anymore. So that was Stevo's idea there. Okay, so um, how do I explain this first part? Um, so basically, uh, okay, uh, this is going to be a monster to explain. But anyways, um, so this part right here, um, the, the P-Switch will move to right about here every single time you come in the door, the first thing. But when you go get the Yoshi, the P-Switch actually despawns and will respawn at this point. So the another thing that happens right when you exit this door is this muncher um, that is being spawn blocked by the coin. The coin block is instantly melted, which means that once you off-screen it and, and re-screen it, if you will, the muncher will spawn. So by going to get this Yoshi, you are going to be re you are going to be spawning this muncher. And what the purpose of this muncher is, I will show you in just a moment. The purpose is to block the P switch. Uh, that didn't really work. So let me go grab the Yoshi first. While activating the POW. Oh my god, you've got to be kidding me. I'm getting trolled by my own level in the editor. Oh my god, the Yoshi. The Yoshi's gone. <laughs> Come on. Okay, here we go, here we go. Wait, why? Okay. <sighs> Alright, I will just do this instead. Okay, so, let me try this again. So we go get the Yoshi, and then when you come back, this Muncher spawns, which actually blocks that P-Switch. So the P-Switch no longer goes to its position. So now, the second time the Thwomp will come down, it will hit that Seesaw, which activates this contraption right here. It's uh, basically... There's a bomb in here, which, when in lava, will explode. And, um... And the spring is what activates... I mean, the spring will basically shoot the shell. And then the shell will activate this, since it's in motion. Um, but aside from that, the idea for this troll was that you would go get Yoshi. You would come back thinking the P-Switch would activate, so you would try to jump on the Thwomp, but the Thwomp goes all the way in the lava. So then you'd think maybe the P-Switch is somehow lower. So you'd come back over here with Yoshi, and you'd sit here because uh, afraid that the P-Switch would activate. But then staying right here actually knocks Yoshi away, and then he will go drown. So that was the whole idea for this troll. It didn't actually work super well. It didn't really work the way it was intended to. But it did get a few people, which was pretty cool. Um, but again, this is mostly Stevo's. I mean, Stevo basically built this entire section. Um, but I, I mean, obviously with me as the builder, I had to make tweaks here and there. Um, but yeah. So again, this this whole twice twice worked out pretty well. Um, but then obviously it gets more complicated the second time you come in when the switch state is off. This is only when the first time you come in. Okay, so, now that you've come up here with Yoshi, you're able to tongue these guys, but 
there's actually a star behind it, and this is actually the grounding glitch. And this works for basically any anything, like even normal entities. So what we have is a parachute star with a pow in the note block, and then this spike ball hits the note block, and for some reason, that will make the star just not bounce. Not bounce. You can just see it just sitting there. And that's this glitch called the grounding glitch. And it's pretty new, sort of new, I don't know for sure, but it's kind of new. Um, this part is pretty easy to explain. This is the part of the twice twice part, but the second time you come in, you, you'll notice that there's two stars. And the reason is because this, um, this will spawn because you're coming in the blue state. So that's why that happens. And then this block will push the star over here and then down to its spot down here. Um, okay, so that's that part. And now finally, um, none of this stuff really correlates to the first part. So I won't, um, basically the only thing that happens here is this spring will come up and push you into the lava over here. And none of this has anything to do with the first part of this troll. So, how this is set up is pretty straightforward. I think actually Jojalal did a similar troll with this, um, but we used it because it was convenient and able to stack on the second half of this troll pretty well. So yeah, that's why we use this. So what happens is this 1-up will push the note block and then the launcher clips into the spring. Well, the spring clips into the launcher, but the force of the note block actually pushes the launcher into the spring. So the purpose of this coin block is to hold this contraption until it's settled. So essentially, after the launcher is inside of the spring, the coin block is able to be melted, which is by this potabo here. And once it's melted, believe it or not, the spring actually stays in the exact same position as it, will, as it was in the launcher despite the launcher moving down. So the launch, the spring will essentially stay exactly like this throughout the time that the launcher is moving downward. So that's why the spring pops up out of nowhere. Yeah, you can kind of see how the spring just stays in its initial position despite the launcher moving down. And that's just weird, bizarre jank. And the one up, uh, the one way is here to knock the player, essentially to keep the player from jumping and knock the player into the vine. So that's basically how this works. Um, yeah. Okay, so for the second half of this room, this entire section, um, I'm just going to use this switch and kind of show how the trolls work before explaining them so that you kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about um, because it's easier to set up this way. So yeah, here we go. So the second time you come into this room, obviously stuff is different. First of all, this guy actually doesn't do the P-switch anymore and that's just simply because this is despawned on the blue state. And that's all there is to it. It's just that the P-switch is despawning. Um, since you're on the blue state, again, this will despawn. And instead, this Thwomp will spawn. Because this block allows it to. This block will be off. So the Muncher will come zooming across at a certain point right about here. And um, since it takes a minute or so, it allows the player to actually get in here before the Thwomp will do this, but what happens is it'll activate the switch, uh, the seesaw, as I've explained with other setups. Um, it does basically the same thing. It hits this note block, which activates the thwomp, which activates the seesaw. Um, this right here, oh, I didn't explain this in the previous part. This stuff despawns, but essentially, since they're able to come over here, uh, this stuff will be able to spawn, which kills this muncher that's on the seesaw. And that's why it, it's able to let you go after after coming over this, this far. So anyway, back to the twice-twice part. Um, so the, the thwomp will hit the seesaw, 
and since this um, this actually will move the launcher over to the right about here and it actually kills the player if they come into here too early. Um, another troll that I completely stumbled on by accident and just decided to in include it was this one and where um, where the thwomp actually hits, the, where the, the seesaw actually launches you up into that spike. That's actually a troll I found completely on accident. So that little end of the seesaw right there actually can launch you upwards. And I just placed the spike here because, you know, who doesn't love a good ride to Spike City? So, yeah. Um, the other thing that'll happen here is that this spring will spawn and then it'll land right about here, which will spring the Yoshi onto this block. And then once they come over to right about here, I believe, is where the spawning is for the switch. So this was the spawn for the um, seesaw. And then this block right here is the spawn for the on-off switch. So the on-off switch is up here. It's a simple contraption that we used earlier in the level where you have a note block and a, uh, with a spike ball and then an on-off switch. And then this will hit it twice really fast. And then this will keep the state in the off state to um, progress through the level in the twice-twice state. So that's all that happens here. The Yoshi will drop as a result of the switch being activated. So they will be able to grab a new Yoshi after this Yoshi dies from the, from the launcher. So after they grab the new Yoshi, um, this will be different. So you'll notice that despite having activated the Thwomp first, and the Thwomp did basically nothing, right? It certainly doesn't fling up like it does when you grab the Yoshi. So if I were to come over here... Uh... Oh. Didn't put that back. So... Oh my god. If I were to come over here, grab the Yoshi... Now something different happens. So you'll notice that a switch is activated, and it's actually because of this. So the spike ball here um, spawns on the blue state. This is the reason why it's different. So right here we have a conveyor. The conveyor will be moving left because it's in the off state, which basically stops the spike ball from rolling further than right about this point where the cursor is. And um, once the switch is activated from this contraption up here, the spike ball will roll into this, um, will roll into the note block, which spawns another spike ball. And this spike ball will hit these blocks, which are a um, another dry shell and a spring, similar to this setup right here. And then they will sit there until the thwomp activates the seesaw again, which then activates the switch. Now. The switch is um, the switch is what activates the second thwomp. Right here, this conveyor will um, this fire flower first of all spawns in on the blue state. Well, um, uh, so it'll be going left. Uh, sorry, it'll be going right. The fire the, this conveyor will be going right because it's in the off state. But um, the instant this switch is activated, the fire flower will then go onto this note block and then push the cannon, push the thwomp onto the seesaw. Very, very similar to other setups in the level. And then this seesaw, of course, will launch this stuff upwards. So the muncher here uh, moves this thwomp all the way up here. So that's how this works. I hope that made sense. I know it's kind of overwhelming, but. I mean, especially to people who don't know setups very well, but I hope that made sense. I mean, this is kind of how it works. I mean, it's just, don't worry about this stuff over here. This stuff all has to, this, this stuff all pertains to this troll right here for the second half of that troll. Um, again, I've already explained this, but there's just a second star up here with a switch block behind it, and that's why there's two stars the second time around. 
this launcher, I don't really want to explain why this launcher is here, it's just for DGs, and basically the level would break without it. So it's to prevent people from activating the swamp first, going to get the Yoshi, and then coming back. So that's why this is here, because this will break because of the block, because of the uh, the bomb right there. Okay, so this is um, this star right here is what comes down at this point. So I know that pe some people didn't actually fall for this troll, but um, essentially what happens is this launcher will. Um, light speed to the left and then send you flying into this uh, this wiggler and then the star will fall just in time so to where you collect it and fall in so it's supposed to be like lol you got baited into going into the pit despite uh, <laughs> to, in, into the star pit basically and yeah it's just it's it's pretty it's actually a very good payoff when it works so I guess the first thing to point out is this spring. So, uh, you know what? I need to make a setup first that actually is similar to this, so BRB. Alright, so here is essentially what's happening with the hyperspeed. I will show it in waters to make it easier to see. So this is what's happening. The spring will stay right here. And the muncher falls onto the spring, which for some reason with this setup will make the launcher just shoot like crazy, just like that. So it is it is a hyperspeed setup, kind of glitchy. And essentially the spring and the muncher get stuck under the same tile under these one ways. So that, I don't know, again, it just happens this way. So I don't really know why it does. Um, now let me load the level as it is. So essentially, I'm, uh, it's going to be a little hard to explain, but I'll do my best. So as you saw, the spring has to be right here for this setup to work. And that spring is actually right here initially. So it goes on this crazy magical journey until it gets to this point. Um, I'll explain why this has to be. So this actually has to start off on a platform because springs don't normally spawn and stay spawned off screen for so long. Um, and that's because of platform physics. For some reason, when you have entities on platforms, they will stay spawned on that platform as long as that platform stays spawned off screen. And it just so happens that platforms on tracks um, specifically will always stay spawned off screen which ensures that this spring will also stay spawned um so it, it is very similar to what i explained about this muncher earlier where this muncher will stay spawned because it's simply on the seesaw so that's the same thing that's going on here it's just that the spring is on the platform this time so as you can sort of see by the tracks the platform will make its way over here, and then the spring will kind of come over here also, and then will stay stuck right here, because the platform will be right here, and then the spring will be right here, stuck in these one ways, and the platform will be just hanging out. So what happens is, you can kind of see how that mushroom pushes this through the platform, but the reason it has to stay here before it can get, um, the reason it has to stay here before you get here is because this on off switch actually will, will be off. So you don't want to put the spring here while the on off switch is off. So you have to come into this section while this off, while the switch state is on both times. And luckily we have this contraption right here, which already switches the state. I know this is this this is already probably losing basically everybody, but this but the fact that it switches right here will put it back on back to the on state, and then we will allow this contraption to work properly by scrolling the screen on onto the on state. So again, um, the spring. So, uh, good lord. 
this is this is really a mess. Um, okay, so at this point, the platform is right here. The spring is right here. They are both off screen, quite a ways away. You're doing your business over here, trying to get Yoshi, and this stuff is happening off screen. This mushroom spawns like normal. It does not spawn until about four blocks off screen, which is right about here-ish. And that's when the mushroom spawns. And then this happens. So, um, again, it's just to ensure that, yeah, I, uh, it's just to ensure that this does not go through the on on off block right here so once you come into this room this setup will essentially set up it'll this mushroom will spawn which pushes it through this platform that it's been on this entire time and then it'll um, move over here to its position right here and then of course as you saw earlier the hyperspeed will activate um, Essentially, if you notice that both times you hit this in the on state, but how do we get it to change back to the off state for the ending? Well, we have this right here, and this is, um, we reuse this exact same spring for the hyperspeed to activate a switch. So it's just like any other switch. We have a, a spike ball right here, which will stop because of this conveyor. It'll only stay about right here. And then the spring from the hyperspeed will come flying into this note block and then push the spike ball into the switch. So that's how that works. It's not super complicated. But I hope everything up to this point has made sense. I know it's really overwhelming to see all this crazy crap. And you'd have to be basically crazy to even watch this entire explanation anyways. <laughs> so props to you for have made it this far for have for having made it this far if you've understand everything up to this point so good for you it's uh, quite the monster of a level um, but I think that's basically everything in this room so we're gonna head over to the ending all right so we have made it to the ending at last and if you've made it this far, I'm sad to say that it doesn't get any less complicated. Because this is an ending that took quite a while to make. So as you can see, it's kind of chaotic. But again, I think it will be pretty straightforward when I explain it. So first, I guess, I mean, if you were curious about what killed you, it's just a spike on a track. And it's kind of funny because he, like, comes in and bodies you. So if you take too long, so yeah, that's all that is. Um, so let's see. Uh, the first thing I'll explain is the Magic Koopa trajectory. So the trajectory is very, um, very delicate. This entire room is basically really delicate. Um, we spent a lot of time designing this room. Well, actually, I spent all the time designing this room, and Stevo, um, the ending idea was in fact Stevo's idea, but um, basically throughout version one all the way to the final version, I spent the entire time uh, by myself uh, designing this ending room. So it has changed a lot throughout the revisions, um, but this is the ending we came up with, and it's quite refined at this point. Okay, anyways, um, on topic here. So, as you can see, the Magic Koopa will uh, destroy the goal, and then the claw comes and picks it up after it's done doing that. Then it takes it up there to where the clown car is, and if you notice, it actually hides behind the clown car perfectly. You have no idea that it's hiding behind there. So another thing to notice is that is how the clown car setup is set up in the first place. This one way actually serves two purposes, but for now, all it's doing is actually keeping the clown car in place. So the clown car will fall on the saw here, and this uh, potobo will follow this little track here and fall into the clown car. So that's simple enough. And then it kind of sticks in place up there, where the Magikoopa is. 
So the Magikoop actually hangs out on this one cloud right here. And this, the other purpose of this one way is to prevent the Magikoopa from firing. So again, just like my last level, if you have a small Magikoopa up against a wall, this does not work. The Magikoopa fires even though it's up against the wall, as you can see. But if it's a big Magikoopa and it's up against a wall, it does not fire. And the reason um, this one way is here is to prevent it from firing any longer. So it, basically, um, the trajectory that the Magikoopa follows is set up in such a way that the Magikoopa will not fire any time after it, del it deletes the goal. So basically, everything in this room is just a distraction. The first troll is that the spring comes out after you cross a certain point, which happens to be this specific square. And the reason that's happening is just a mole contraption up above. So the mole has a sideways spring on it, and the sideways spring will boop this shell and send it flying in this direction to the hidden block over here, which carries a spike ball. And the spike ball will come down and kill this. So everything in this room for this one troll is just a distraction. It's all shiny bait. There's an obvious pipe behind here that we tried very little to hide and on purpose because we want them to be able to see this pipe and to enter it at some point. So, um, so this switch, well, the first time you come in, this switch will be solid. So, again, the, the mole will actually activate the logway over here. But when it's on the, when it, when it's not solid, it actually does something completely different. The shell comes down here. So I think what's happening here is that the shell actually loses speed because it's hitting this block. And by somehow surviving this block, it somehow just loses speed. Um, so... Um, yeah, this is kind of hard to explain, but this is how it's diff- This is the only reason that this room is different. Is just because of this one on-off block right here. So what happens when the switch is hit in the twice twice room? Uh, this bomb will be spawning because you're spawning in on the red state, and we'll walk over here to where this mushroom is. And then there is a one way behind here preventing the bomb from moving any further. So when the switch is hit, the bomb will explode because there's a block behind it, and this coin that's right here will fall on this note block. And the note block spawns a spike ball. And the spike ball, this is a crazy series of events, but just bear with me. The spike ball will fall and kill the Magikoopa that's sitting right here. And then the spike ball will fall down here to spawn a spring from this block. And the spring from this block will boop the will move this mushroom will basically spring the mushroom toward the player and then this spring it also has a purpose of sitting right here where this magic of it is so the spring will eventually end up right here and able to spring the mushroom on the other side of the goal so everything has its use everything um has its purpose in this level, and it's really, I know it's really convoluted, but hopefully that made sense. Um, the other thing to mention is that this Magikoopa is actually um, using a glitch to off-center it. So if you notice, it's actually off-centered right now, even though it's a big enemy, and how you do that is, um, I'll show you the process here. So you take a big enemy, um, I have to delete a couple enemies because to make room for this setup here. So you place a little mole under, or a little muncher underneath this big enemy that you want to off center. You place a block under that, and then you place anything on top of the mole. 
For some reason, this only works when the mole has, when the enemy you want to off center has something stacked on top of it, which is why this uh, can launcher is on top of the um, magic Koopa this way. If you notice, when I delete this launcher, the magic Koopa will go back to its original position. So this launcher has to stay on top of it for this glitch to work. So basically, all you you do from here is put the wings on and then delete this and now it's off centered so that's how this works and again deleting this or moving the mole anywhere will put it back in position so the reason this glitch is used is because you're coming out of a door and the door actually perfectly aligns with the magic koopa as you're coming out of it so there's no scroll stop on either side of the screen and you can see at the very top right of the screen uh, how the magic how the magic cube is actually destroying the gold. And so by moving the screen up with no screen lock on either side of the screen, um, it's able to stay exactly uh, perfectly off screen so that you actually can't see it while the screen is moving up. So this is a strategy that we use to hide the. It's basically just to help hide the magic koopa so um that's basically all it is uh, but it's kind of complicated there's a lot of stuff we um thought out in, toward this ending um so one th last thing to mention is how the fish come down um during the twice twice section and that's just because of this block right here this is a progressive power up so by the time you collect the mushroom, this will have already activated, so... Or, actually, this will not have activated yet. So, it only activates right after you collect the mushroom. And, again, it's because of this right here. Uh, let me take this off. So you can see how that works. The mushroom hits both of the note blocks and then bounce, bounces back up. So that's basically how that works. One last very important thing to point out about this ending is the these coins right here. So if you notice, when you come out of the door, you can't really see this very the goal very well, but if I were to remove these coins for a brief moment and enter the door, you would actually see the goal a lot easier. So these coins actually help to conceal the goal, if you notice that in the top right of the screen right there. So the coins actually help a lot to conceal the goal, and the Magic Koopa will still hit the goal through these coins. So that's pretty helpful. And one last thing is that the Magic Koopa, in order to make it spawn only a coin, we have to use Entity Limit. Um, the Entity Limit process that we used was quite difficult because, uh, so when you spawn out of this door, the, ent the current Entity Limit on the screen has to be over 100, but when you come over here, we have to be able to get rid of that entity limit by the time the screen scrolls so that we can spawn stuff out of this block. So if you notice, um, let me let me, uh, let me me load the file again and then go back to the ending so that I can show you what I'm talking about. And then we can have all that stuff fixed. Okay, so I'm going to put a block here with a muncher and show exactly why the Magic Koopa only shoots a coin. So, for this screen, see, right here, the Magic Koopa shooting only a coin is basically the same thing as spawning nothing from a block. So, by spawning a coin from the note, from the goal, uh, the Magic Koopa, or it's basically at 100, it's over, the entity limit is overloaded, and the Magic Koopa is unable to spawn anything else. We wouldn't want the Magic Koopa to spawn, say, a ghost, because then it would be just there in the way of the, of the path. So, 
this screen, again, this screen has to have, has to be overloaded with 100 entities. So that's why we have this here. All of this stuff actually spawns in with the ending. Uh, out of the door. And this part right here also contributes to the entity count at the ending, which is why we have it here in the first place. And then this also will spawn five extra entities right here, which will all add up to exactly 100, including all of the one-ways over here. All of these one-ways also add up to the entity limit. So using this combined with all of this, we are able to get exactly 100 entities. Now, when the screen scrolls this way, all of this stuff that was over here despawns because it's being off-screened. And that allows us to bring the entity limit down to like 90 or so. So now that it's 90, we can spawn stuff again from blocks. So that's why all of this stuff is over here, so that it can, it can spawn for the entity limit for the Magikoopa, and then despawn later so that we can do other stuff. Hopefully that made sense and um, again if you've made it to the very end good for you. This is a really complex level and took quite a while but in the end I think it turned out really really well and I'm just super happy I was able to do this with Stevo. He's a uh, He's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, real, real accomplishment. Like it took quite a long time. But um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed and listening to me ramble about all this crazy crap because it's kind of cool and interesting. <laughs> so I hope you guys are nerding out like I am. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed again and. I'll see you next time.